Okay, so I've got a question for you. What's the most common thing I see stopping women from recording their music themselves? And I'll give you a clue. It's not lack of recording gear or technical skill. And if you're thinking, but Isabel, I don't have either of those things. I'm not saying they don't matter, but they're actually not the biggest barrier. The number one obstacle I see time and time again is not knowing how to make a watertight recording plan you can actually follow through on. You see, recording gear has gotten way more affordable these days, or even free, and there's a million and one tutorials on YouTube. But what leaves so many musicians stalling for months, or even years, is not having a mapped out recording plan. This can mean you have no idea how to even get started and risk wasting precious time and money. But once you have a plan, you're ready to get out of feeling stuck with your music and step into being an empowered 21st century woman in music who's no longer reliant on other people to get your music out into the world. And if that feels like a distant dream right now, I'd love to invite you to join me inside the Home Recording Kickstarter, a live five-day challenge just for women in music. Inside this totally transformative challenge, I'll walk you through the five key stages of planning out your first or next release-worthy recording project. And I'll be hosting live Q&As and busting some of the most common music tech myths so you feel lit up and counting down the days till you finally share beautiful sounding recordings of your music this year. And I'm also giving you the chance to upgrade your Kickstarter experience to VIP face-to-face group coaching so you have lots of extra time to get your questions answered and implement all the daily challenge trainings with me in person. So if record an album has been on your to-do list for any amount of time or you're simply looking for an injection of home recording motivation and know-how, this Kickstarter challenge has your name on it. If you have a feeling there's an album baby just waiting to emerge out the other side of this Kickstarter challenge, head over to femalediymusician.com forward slash Kickstarter. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash Kickstarter and get ready to record your music and show up in a bigger way in 2023. Imagine if you could put just a bit of consistent practice in over the coming weeks and months. Maybe you'd be able to record everything yourself. Or perhaps record in a studio but then take the raw audio back to produce and mix yourself. Or do all of this yourself. Think how much money you could save doing so. Would that mean the difference between you being able to continue making and sharing music as an artist? Let alone all the other benefits, like just feeling incredibly fulfilled proud and in control of your creative process. Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female-identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another full, fat episode of your favourite feminist music tech podcast, Girls Twiddling Knobs. And today we're talking about money, dear listener, because unless you've been living under a rock, you'll have noticed that economics all over the world have been hit pretty hard over the last few months. And so I wanted to check in and ask if this period of financial insecurity has ever made you question your ability to keep making music. I ask because many musicians are having to make some tough decisions when it comes to basic living costs, let alone investing in their careers. It's not easy performing, recording or releasing music when you're just trying to pay the mortgage, gas bill or afford the weekly shop. And despite some people in power treating the arts as some kind of nice to have luxury, I know that doubting if you can keep investing in your music might feel really, really shit and even be keeping you up at night. After all, making and sharing your music might be the best therapy you've ever come across or connect you to vital networks of like-minded people. It might also have enabled you to fully express your sense of self in ways no other space has ever allowed you to do. 
These things aren't a luxury. They're an integral part of being human. And if you've felt any of the above, no doubt your music has given this experience back to the people you've shared it with too. So I wanted to make an episode of the podcast that directly addressed this and specifically share how I believe that having the ability to record and produce yourself will not only save you money, but could also make you money too. And before you start worrying that this is going to be some pie in the sky, let's make a hit record baby bullshit. Don't worry, it's really not, dear listener. Making an income from your music isn't always straightforward and there's no sugarcoating that. But having some basic skills in recording and production is one of the best ways that you can keep showing up as an artist, regardless of a global recession, and I'm going to show you how. Because this period of time will pass. And I want to make sure that when we come out the other side, you and as many other women are still here doing your thing, taking up space and sharing your voice. And if you're struggling financially right now, keep listening to learn about organisations and funds that can help. OK, so let's get into it. So first up, let's just acknowledge that here in the UK, at least, the last six months have been a bleeping bleep show. I doubt I have to give you a lecture on what happened. You're probably sick to death of hearing the news about it all. But just in case, I'm going to do a quick recap over what's gone down before then discussing how this is affecting musicians right now. So after the financial wreckage of COVID here in the UK, Boris Johnson resigned as Prime Minister in July 2022, even though he narrowly won a no confidence vote a few weeks beforehand. This was largely informed by the countless times he and his cabinet had either full out broken the very laws they enforced during lockdown, but also about other factors which we won't get into here. By September, Liz Truss had been elected as the leader of the Conservative Party and therefore the new Prime Minister. And on Friday, the 23rd of September, her new Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, announced the biggest programme of tax cuts in half a century. Since Kwarteng's mini budget, the pound dropped to its lowest level against the dollar since 1985. Kwarteng also prevented the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility from producing its own forecast for the UK economy and instead claimed that his measure would cause the economy to grow by 2.5%. However, what ensued was massive instability in the markets, material risks to UK financial stability and the impending threat to pensions – And so in direct response and in an unprecedented act, the Bank of England launched a £65 billion move to pay off some of this government debt. The result? Out with Truss and Kwarteng and in with Rishi Sunak. And as I record this episode, that is pretty much where we've gotten to. But I'm confident that the damage that has been sustained will still be unfolding as this goes out live, regrettably. Now, this podcast isn't here to peddle any particular political agenda, and you may believe that the decisions made by the merry-go-round of Conservative Prime Ministers and Chancellors over the last few years have been good and justified. But there is one thing that isn't in question. People are harder up. Unless you're outright rich, you'll be feeling the pinch, and many people will have had to make difficult choices they wouldn't have even imagined five years ago due to this lack of financial stability. So this much you probably know already if you're living in the UK or watching from elsewhere. And I apologise that this episode has such an Anglo-focused view of the current financial situation so far. It's safe to say that wherever you're listening to this podcast from, you'll have been affected by the global economic crisis left in the wake of COVID, but also hugely fuelled by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the devastating impact this has had on food, trade, gas prices and more. But how does all this affect musicians specifically? Well, I think you and I have a pretty good idea, right, dear listener? I mean, chances are that you're a musician of some description, no matter whether this makes up all part or none of your income, you'll have been affected in some way. One of the most obvious effects is that everyday essential costs are just more expensive. Mortgages have gone up, rent has followed, energy costs... Groceries and lots of other everyday expenses have risen well above wages. This affects everyone, including musicians. But more specifically, the supply chain has been affected so much that some pieces of equipment or even merchandise have been hard to come by. This has delayed releases and projects and income for musicians in return. When it comes to live music, this is more of a mixed bag because if the next few months unfold anything like the 2008 financial crash... 
people will attend more live gigs than usual, which could generate more income for venues and musicians. However, many small venues have struggled to keep the doors open due to the cost increases mentioned before, so musicians may also find it hard or more competitive to get live slots. And there are huge pressures on touring due to increased overheads, meaning that musicians at a mid to upper level of the industry will also be affected. Similarly to smaller live venues, smaller recording studios may also find it hard to survive. The rising energy costs in particular will be difficult to offset. This is a huge blow to the industry because, like small live venues, many of these smaller recording studios are vital creative hubs, both in their surrounding community and the industry at large. Furthermore, many musicians will have to think twice about recording in commercial studios due to the wider financial squeeze, further exacerbating the situation on these small businesses. You might even have re-evaluated whether you can afford studio time yourself this year. And one final thing I'll touch on about how musicians are being affected is that many organisations, charities and even individuals just have less spare cash, which potentially means less work for musicians, depending on the type of artist you are. So, for example, people might cut back a little on their spending for big celebrations like weddings and therefore hire a DJ instead of a live band. Another example is that charities might have less funding for arts projects and therefore employ less musicians for workshops and community events. We don't have time to go through every single way musicians are affected by the current financial uncertainty. I've definitely missed a bunch of other stuff here. But the point is that the current economic crisis is affecting the music industry and musicians like you and me. It's here where I want to reassure you that this episode is not going to be all doom and gloom. I have some really good news and thoughts to share with you in just a minute. But before we do so, I did just want to dig into how these challenges might specifically affect women, this being girls twiddling knobs. It's an important question to consider because the experience of women and gender expansive musicians can still often be quite different to their male counterparts, even if this isn't always acknowledged in more general discussions on the topic of the music industry during times of recession. And there's three big reasons women are hit differently that I'm going to briefly consider now. These are the gender pay gap, caring responsibilities and risk avoidance. So first up, the gender pay gap. Now, it's notoriously difficult to analyse the difference in earnings between freelance musicians. Often earnings are coming from different sources and it's difficult to get specific breakdowns for an individual's income. But there are some good indications from elsewhere in the industry. One of those being the gender pay gap that has been reported across music organisations such as record labels, as reported in Music Business Weekly. If you're interested in learning more about these stats, check out the link in the show notes, but here's a shorthand version. Overall, women are still largely outnumbered by their male counterparts, making up on average just over 30% of the workforce across some of the biggest players like Spotify and Sony Music. That means if less women are employed in these organisations, less women are earning money in them too. But of those women employed, they experience a gender pay gap of on average 28.2%. That means that for exactly the same job, with the same responsibilities and job title, for every pound a woman earns, her male counterpart is earning an extra 28.2 pence on top for doing absolutely nothing. And someone might listen to this and think, but that doesn't necessarily translate into musicians' earnings. Well, let's have a look at some more statistics. Counting the music industry is a gender gap analysis of over 300 music publishers and record companies in the UK. This research reveals that just over 14% of writers currently signed to publishers and just over 20% of artists signed to labels are female. That means more men are being supported on financial retainers from publishing and record companies and having their recording, touring and production costs covered as part of these arrangements. Now, it's true that not every single record or publishing deal will include being paid a monthly retainer and that musicians often have to pay back upfront investments such as recording over time. But it still points to more male musicians being financially supported by the industry than women. If we accept that there is a gender pay gap, both within the industry and between women and men freelancers, then this means that women are already on the back foot financially and the current economic crisis will be felt harder and faster by us. Secondly, let's consider caring responsibilities. Even when the economy is in a good place, 
parents will have to make the decision of whether to take work or pay for childcare here in the UK. If childcare isn't an option, it will then come down to the choice of which parent stays at home and which one goes out to work. Now, speaking from a purely heteronormative perspective, this usually means women staying at home and taking time out of their career in their children's early years, if this is what you decide to do, but also because of the gender pay gap. Therefore, most of the time, this leaves families having to prioritise the father's work, as there will likely be more of it and it will likely be better paid. That really matters if you're having to exist on one person's salary, especially if you're both freelancers. But this, of course, then puts women at a disadvantage when they're ready to re-enter the industry and pick up their careers again. And it's not just parents who struggle with this issue. Women make up the vast majority of people providing care for vulnerable relatives and loved ones, both because of the gender pay gap issue outlined before, but also because it's expected by other people and society at large. This is free labour that can be incredibly challenging and exhausting and prevent women from fully participating in other areas of their life, including music. Lastly, whenever there's wider uncertainty, especially of a financial nature, bigger companies become more risk averse. How does this affect women in music? Well, it could mean that record companies and other music industry organisations and individuals are less likely to take a chance on an artist they don't know or who isn't already established. Of course, there are women in music who have built up impressive fan bases, contacts and networks, so this isn't going to affect everyone. But as women and other gender minorities are still significantly underrepresented across the industry, some parts of the industry may become less open to expanding their rosters and instead go with what they already know. This already happens. One case in point being the issue surrounding music festival lineups where bookers and promoters claim they can't take the risk on female artists in case they can't sell out their shows. And of course, this is highly questionable anyway. But in a financially turbulent time with all the financial pressures we've already outlined affecting the industry's bottom line, women and gender minorities may find it harder to catch a break. I really hope not, but it's something that isn't discussed enough. And so I wanted to flag it here. But knob twiddlers, I do have some good news. I know we've been a bit doom and gloom so far on this episode, but it's not all bad. I now want to share three ways you can recession proof your music so that no matter what else happens, you're still standing, making and sharing your music when we get out the other side of the next few months. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not necessarily talking about earning 100% of your income from your music, especially if you're not already doing so. And I'm not pushing some kind of icky, here's how to produce a hit song kind of narrative. You know me too well, dear listener, to be blowing smoke up your ass. But I'm on a mission to make sure that as many women in music are still able to make and share their music on their terms, despite any kind of global financial crisis or recession. Because otherwise, what might happen is we lose some of the amazing talent and unique voices that women offer the industry and their audiences. So I'm not just going to talk about ways to make money, but also I'm going to talk about saving money so that you can keep making music. First up, it may come as no surprise to you that what I'm about to say That's right, you guessed it. If you can learn just even the basics of how to self-record and produce your music, you will instantly be able to save yourself a considerable amount of money over the next few months and many years to come. I know I might be preaching to the choir here, but if you're listening to this podcast and you still haven't gotten around to learning more about recording and production, then just know that you can add save money to your list of reasons to get on and do so. To just put it into perspective, Let's say you wanted to record a five track EP. Even if you were super efficient and recorded one track a day in a commercial recording studio, you'd still be potentially looking at paying £100 an hour for studio time. If you were recording seven hours a day for five days, that's already £3,500. Even if you could find a studio at half the price, you're still looking at £1,750, and that's before mixing and mastering. But if you were able to complete some of the recording from home and or do some of the production yourself, you could be saving hundreds or even thousands of pounds. And for many musicians, that will be the difference between them actually being able to keep showing up during these difficult financial times and fading into obscurity. 
And imagine if you could put just a bit of consistent practice in over the coming weeks and months. Maybe you'd be able to record everything yourself. Or perhaps record in a studio but then take the raw audio back to produce and mix yourself. Or do all of this yourself. Think how much money you could save doing so. Would that mean the difference between you being able to continue making and sharing music as an artist? Let alone all the other benefits, like just feeling incredibly fulfilled, proud and in control of your creative process. So whether that means learning more about recording and production through free YouTube videos, podcasts like this one, or joining me inside the Home Recording Kickstarter five-day challenge that's starting on January the 27th, There has never been a better time to commit to honing these skills. You could save yourself thousands of pounds over the coming months and well into your career. My second tip for recession-proofing your music is to offer your musical abilities as a service for others. And what I mean by this is not just working on your own projects or doing free favours for friends, but actively advertising your skill set so people can hire you for their projects too. Now, surprise, surprise, this gets even easier if you have recording and production skills, even just the basics, because it means you can collaborate with people all over the world. For example, perhaps you know you could do a great job at writing vocal top lines for other people's tracks, who either don't sing or write for voice. If you can record and produce, even with just a very basic setup, you can start offering this as a paid-for service from the comfort of your own home. Likewise, you might be a violinist and know you could probably pretty easily add strings to a variety of people's projects. Being able to record yourself from the comfort of your own home and send this over to a musician or producer as a paid-for service is a great way to use your skills and supplement your income without having to trek across the country to recording studios. And so my final tip for recession-proofing your music is by creating and selling samples online. And before you say, but Isabel, isn't every single producer in the world trying to do that? Let me share my spin on this. So you're right. If you type into Google how to make money as a producer, selling beats and loops will be on every single list of tips and strategies. And that means that lots of people are likely doing it. But I think there's still an untapped market here for people making loops and samples that buck the usual trend. And... I think we as women in music are a unique position to make our mark. Because let's come back to that vocalist who's thinking of offering her services as a vocal top line writer and producer. Perhaps she has the ability to create sublime, mesmerising close part harmonies for other people to download, sample and loop however they like. Maybe she even gets super experimental and makes a whole sample pack of whispers, hums, breaths and other vocal sounds unlike anything anyone else is offering. And take that violinist who was thinking of offering home recorded string parts to other musicians. What if she also started creating samples and loops of different violin parts with pizzicato plucking and even hitting the body with the bow and other extended techniques? There is real potential to record sample packs that are truly original and that other people will pay for. I'm not saying either of these examples will lead to earning a fortune overnight, but maybe they would open up new revenue streams that you could grow and develop alongside the other things you're already doing. One advantage to this third idea is also that once you've recorded your samples and loops, you can sell them again and again without any further work on your part. So it could be a really great addition to your other work as a musician. With all the ideas I've shared here, all you need is a very basic home setup and a little recording and production know-how. But the payoff is that you could, at the very least, save yourself a lot of money by recording your music yourself and even add some extra income streams through offering your services to other musicians and selling your own loops and samples online. Like I said before, this is not some kind of get rich overnight through your music type of thing. My intention here is to support you and as many other women to stick around throughout the coming months as things are tight financially so that we don't lose your unique and important creative voice. So whether it's just being able to make music on a tighter budget or increasing the different ways you can earn money from your music and abilities, I hope these tips are useful to recession proof your music. Lastly, if you're listening to this episode and you're struggling financially, then I want you to just make sure you're aware of the help and support you might be eligible for. 
Help Musicians offers support for musicians in the UK who are in financial hardship. You can learn more about this support at helpmusicians.org.uk forward slash get hyphen support forward slash musicians hyphen welfare. But you'll also find that link in the show notes because I know it's a little bit lengthy. If you're a member of the Musicians Union, again here in the UK, you could also be entitled to their parental support and benevolent grants too. And if you're struggling with an illness or injury, then Help Musicians, the British Association of Performing Arts Medicine or the Royal Society of Musicians of Great Britain have specific funds available. I've linked to all of these schemes here in the show notes. I myself have had to access this type of support in the past because of illness and how it affected my ability to pay my bills and continue earning through my music. I know for many people applying for this type of support can feel vulnerable, exposing or even shameful, but please do reach out for help if you need it. So many people need to access support from time to time and you deserve it as much as the next person, dear listener. Now, I'm really excited to share next week's episode with you because I'll be joined by one of my amazing Home Recording Academy alumni students, Jess Magooch. And this episode is especially relevant for anyone listening who might have started learning to record and produce themselves, but then gave up because it just felt too hard. Jess has been there and got the t-shirt, but she hung in there and she ended up not only surprising herself at how much she enjoyed recording and production, but also blowing the mind of a major sync exec when she shared her self-recorded music with them too. To hear all about it, join me here next week. But till then, take care and I'll catch you here soon. Girls Twiddling Knobs is hosted and produced by me, Isabel Anderson, with production support from Jade Bailey. The show notes are compiled by Francesca O'Connor, and this is a female DIY musician production. Just before you take out your earbuds and go off and do whatever it is you're going to do next, dear listener, Make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. I'd hate for you to miss any future episodes, especially any bonus ones we might release on the sly. Hit subscribe and thank me later. Right, I'll let you get on with your day now. Bye.